Welcome to the Change Within Podcast. My name is Gerard Uselli, and we are on episode 58. Through one person's perspective at a time, we are exploring the change within people as they've experienced things through their lives, good, bad, and everything in between, to ensure that we are all human in the way that we grow throughout the process of existing. And in that case, I have a very special guest today. This guy is one of my favorite rappers of all time as far as just putting me in the mood to stay motivated. One of the core essences of staying motivated in that case, and it's an understatement to say that I'm blessed and honored to have him. Let me introduce to everybody, Rex. Rex, how are you today? Peace, man. Appreciate the flowers, the love, man. That, that was just beautiful. So uh, everything is blessed and, and glad to be a part, part of your, your cast. Absolutely. And something that I always like to ask all of my guests who've been on my platform, and this is the first question for you as well. What was your childhood like growing up? Uh, childhood was... Um, it was it was a, a mixed bag of like uh, emotional roller coaster, but at the same time, uh, beautiful uh, beautiful upbringing. Um, you know, we had uh, a small little city by the name uh, uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, that uh, kind of like uh, fit, played the backdrop in the um, in the bedrock of, of my upbringing. It's a tough place to grow up in, uh, but uh, it's valuable to grow up in. Uh, you get so many experiences. Uh, good and bad, and uh, ha coming up with uh, my mom, uh, being a young young teen, uh, raising myself, and my sister Nikia, uh, before my little sister was born, um, it, it was incredible to like like see her uh, work hard to like get us everything that we were able to uh, achieve in our life, uh, mentally, spiritually, and physically. Uh, so I, I'm I'm very appreciative of of the good and the bad that, that came about in my childhood. I think to also level off in the sense of conversation, especially in valuing work ethic as a young age. So for myself, my father was in the mill rights as a construction worker. And throughout maybe the first five to eight years of my life, I didn't really see him very much because of the demand of his job. And a little, maybe like a few years later, it did help me realize how much he's been working to lay a foundation as a high school dropout. And then understanding that it takes the 10,000 hours in his perspective for me to understand how things have been. So my question to you is, when did you realize as far as for the parental figures in your life for you to understand, wow, they're really doing everything they're doing for me? Uh, I think it was the village mentality, honestly, without me truly uh, being able to uh, expound or understand uh, uh, how to, how to uh, express that as a youth. Uh, later on in life, it, it became uh, quite apparent that it was the village approach to raising us that, um, that really uh, affected me most, and it was their hard work as that village and that culture that that uh, created a desire within me to uh, pay it forward the same kind of way for the individuals that come after me. And um, I'm talking about my my legacy, my progeny, but also uh, any any of the youth that I, I affect through music, through um, social uh, activism, through anything that I do. Uh, I, I think of that village mentality and that uh, that hard hard work and effort to um, uh, pay it forward uh, throughout, not just my family location, but like it, where I grew up, uh, it wasn't just about uh, mom, dad, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, uh, you know, cousins, nieces, nephews. It was these individuals who were neighbors. Uh, many times were um, were uncles and aunts. I was calling uncle. I was calling uh, a neighbor and uncle. I was calling a lot of individuals who were in our surrounding territories, uh, uncles and aunts. And it was that culture that kind of cultivated something in me uh, long lasting now. Absolutely. And then in the essence of having that community relations between people who are around you, I'm a firm believer that we are all products of our environment. 
So to take a little step back on the next question, I wanted to ask you this is kind of like a first part. How did you stumble upon rap music between your environment? So growing up in, in Lawrence, like I said, um, uh, it's an, it's a small it's a small city, but uh, it is is a city affected quite um, uh, quite uh, profoundly by the the state of New York. Uh, you have a lot of individuals who migrated north into uh, Massachusetts uh, from New York uh, via the Caribbean, uh, specifically in Lawrence. Uh, it's a lot of Dominican, uh, Puerto Rican heritage, and then through the Black migration, there was a lot of individuals who came from the South North into Lawrence. Uh, and the reason why individuals ended up in Lawrence was because of the textile mills and the industrial, like uh, just uh, post-industrial revolution. Uh, 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 Industrial Revolution, excuse me. There was um uh, there was a need for workers in those in this location. And this was one of the most prominent areas for uh, workers uh, in the mills. Um, and so uh, after that, you know, individuals migrating into that area, there was still a, a, an influx and a rotation of individuals coming in from New York. And I think within that rotation, uh, there were individuals going back to New York, hitting the sounds of the city and coming back to a small city like Lawrence and bringing in what was brand new. And what was brand new was the sound of, of the Bronx and, and hip hop music. And, and by that, by, v, by way of uh, that um, kind of uh, uh, rover, I was able to get my first uh, impressions of what hip hop was. And I was a break dancer first. I was a, a, a b-boy uh, in a group called Funk Town Connection. And, and that was a, a major thing, uh, a, a major starting point for me uh, before I gravita gravitated to the mic. Yes, and then going from there, especially that you got your footing, <laughs> not a play on words, but you doing that, that was good break, though. <laughs> doing that, that was in break dancing. I wanted to ask, how did like how did that kind of transpire you to then start using your voice from the music that you were dancing to? Like what was kind of the core element to have, that brought you from being on the floor to being on the mic? It was movies like uh, Beat Street and Wild Style and, and Break It, the breaking films that um, we would go see at this small little uh, um, cinema uh, in our in our town. And uh, Beat Street in particular was the one that had me gravitating towards the mic because I was I was watching for that part of the culture again that was about the dancing aspect. Um, but uh, when I saw Kumo D doing the Christmas rap. Uh, that oh, yeah. Was one of the first things that kind of like really, it really motivated me to. Uh, there's, a, there's a story that goes around and it goes like, you know, I would go to the schoolyard and I would continue, continue to, uh, I rehearsed and I would recite uh, the Kumo D Christmas rap on this little make, uh, makeshift stage in the back of my uh, uh, elementary school. And a girl called me out. She said, that's not your rhyme. And so I had to, um, prove myself by like, you know, starting to pin my own rhymes and uh, uh, started uh, writing my first rhymes. And my first rhyme was called uh, Puma. And um, I, I would recite Puma uh, on that little makeshift stage and started to get some attention in the schoolyard and, and the rest was history for me. Did you feel like you had the sense of nerves even as a kid growing up or this happens to people a lot that I spoke, that I speak to some people, especially in like their youth, uh, around like a kid's age, if they're put under pressure in those moments, they have an easier time thriving, being in front of people. How are you towards crowds? I'll be honest, I feel like uh, even to this day, that's the reason why uh, being in the like tough moment has always been, you know, my go-to, like my goal, like I, I, I crave kind of that moment to like prove myself in those instances because you know uh being the oldest of my siblings but being the youngest like kind of hanging around my older cousins and stuff like that I always had to kind of like prove that I wasn't afraid uh you know and I, that I could be outspoken and not, not be overlooked in those kind of circumstances so I was always attempting to prove myself kind of uh with my older cousins and stuff like that 
um, and, and have my voice kind of stand out. Cause I, you know, when you're young and you have a little squeaky voice, uh, that's kind of where I was uh, as, a, as a little kid as we all are. And, um, and I had to like, you know, really prove myself and find something that kind of like made my voice profound. And uh, the music definitely was that. I didn't know that uh, I, had, I had an innate God-given gift to like up in poetry, but um, that, that, gift, um, that gift is a blessing um, and that, you know, it, it, it's taken me around the world. So I'm, I'm very happy for it. I think to also capture that moment for the fact that it was a pretty seamless process for you to write rhymes on your own at that point. And I do recall this in other interviews you've been in for you to explain that the process from going from writing your own rhymes versus crafting your own songs was a difference in your own journey. I wanted to kind of explore the sense of like, how did you change up your style to write songs? So um, the main thing was um, when I was when I was pinning um, when I was pinning a lot of uh, uh, rhymes uh, early on, I was just trying to battle everybody and take everyone's heads off and, and prove prove myself. Um, and then I would enter a lot of ciphers. I would enter a lot of battles, and. Um, I thought that was my platform. I thought that's just was my, my way of expressing who I was. Um, but, you know, listening to uh, individuals like, like specifically in, in, in Tupac, I, I, have, I have massive respect for Tupac Shakur, um, but he wasn't someone who I listened to on a consistent basis as, as an MC. But I, I, always, I always valued what he said when he was off the mic, which is which is uh, pretty interesting. It's, it's like you know, like whenever he was like speaking um, about any topic, like he 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 would, he would capture capture you. Uh, and uh, one of the things he was noted for stating was like you know making sure that like you know writing writing about everything, like anything that comes to mind, anything that you know you think about. Uh, should be spoken about. So it doesn't matter what it is, you know what I'm saying? Empty fridge, you know, full fridge, the, you know, uh, what's on the table, like, you know, just got into an argument with a girlfriend, you know what I'm saying? Got a date on, on Friday, like what every, every single topic that comes to mind should have something to pin. And uh, that was part of uh, how I started to craft, like, you know, topical matter. Uh, and then I realized a lot of what was interwoven in, in the landscape around me was free game for me to like utilize as uh, a plethora of uh, you know different topical matter to speak about. So I would break down things from uh, in, into different sections. Uh, the same way I would break down my stocks and bonds. I'd look or, or, or my baseball cards and my trading cards and look at you know points, rebounds, assists, or you know stocks and look at the different uh, sectors. So I'd break down. You know economics and politics and uh, science and math and uh, love and a different topic and then from those topics you could have subtopics that I would utilize to like you know um, be able to break down you know how I'm feeling and express uh, the different things that are going on inside my mind. I also think in those retrospects especially in a sports setting what you were saying with economics and politics, having the subcategories in health, science, it does fundamentally make sense, no matter what your hobbies or interests are, for you to integrate them and how it's influenced your style going forward and what you've been crafting. Because again, kind of in the product of environment ordeal, you're able to kind of take things from the personal surroundings of yourself versus what you're kind of aspiring to be and what you idolize in those moments as someone growing up. Now, kind of to segue a little Absolutely. bit going forward, this is a pretty interesting point. Now, I see in your past interviews, you have a lot of people saying who you've worked with, it speaks for itself. I did want to ask this to you though. Right. <laughs> so for the essence of being in a studio, all your years of experience, being in the rooms with so many different people, what do you think it takes for greatness to happen in the studio? Oh, that's that's a very good question. Um, I, I I do feel um, 
greatness is, is a tough word first and foremost to like um, pinpoint and define uh, for each individual. I mean, we all have our own, uh, you know, interesting perspectives. So um, some people value greatness and we, we're going to place greatness on, on, on different um, uh, pedestals and different levels, right? Uh, for me, uh, greatness is achieved when uh, you you have reached a, a, a point where you have such a uh, profound impact on individuals um, uh, through the work. If we're talking about if we if we're talking about the music that you create through the word and, and through the sound bed that comes out of that that um, that uh, studio. So I think uh, greatness is attained uh, not through mastery of your craft. But the commitment that it takes to, you know, get in the booth and do uh, do your due diligence to understand everyone who's taken the time to be in the in, in the stu in the in the booth. Uh, when you truly understand those individuals and their impacts in the game, right? Uh, you take that with your talent. You take that with with um, understanding and and uh, appreciating. Um, the sound bed, when I say the sound bed, I'm thinking about the instrumentation, right? So uh, the instrumentation itself, um, when you're able to marry your instrument, your voice to that instrument and take from that uh, a respect for the individuals who have kind of paved the path and uh, implement your, your version of their voices and their impacts, I feel like you've attained some form of greatness. I think um, uh, whenever I go into the studio, I am, I am in the studio uh, affected by Stevie Wonder. I'm in the studio affected by Nina Simone. I'm affected by DJ Premier. I'm affected by Dilla. Um, I, my intention is to be so, um, uh, so focused, uh, so uh, laser sharp focused on uh, the, what I pen and the topical matter that I expound in the, in the booth that it um, that it creates something that's long lasting for those who come, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road. So I think I think greatness for me is that uh, for the next individual greatness might you know, not be so interwoven and, and so complex or uh, so simple. Uh, for some people that might be simple, for some people that very complex. I think to just add an extra bullet point to everything you were just saying, the commonality between the four artists that you mentioned is there are moments through footage you're able to see and document how music captures them. And when music captures you, you don't put a time on it. You put a sense of your own morale on it. And that's the most timeless thing ever because the four people you just mentioned Absolutely. have a timeless approach in how they've impacted music over time. Absolutely. I think also Absolutely. in the uh, sense of that and also within those years of uh, working towards the legacy of your career, it, this has been a very interesting point as far as like discovering your music. And my question to you is, in a world where we constantly strive for accolades, your song Bitch Slap that came out a few years ago, it's kind of like an anthem to keep ourselves grounded. What's one moment in your career that felt like a bitch slap and how do you come back from it? Uh, there was a, po a period where um, I was done with music. Uh, that's, always, that, that's always that point, that um, crossroads point for me that, that, I, that I go back to and think about because I was, I was completely done. I was like, I didn't understand how to balance music and family life. And, and if I was even, uh, at the time, I was like uh, questioning whether I was good enough to, to um, you know, make it as a, as a hip hop artist. Uh, and I still was at a period where I was questioning to even make it as a hip hop artist. Uh, so there were so many uh, question, questions I had, uh, you know, unanswered and so many voices around me telling me which way to go uh, to, to make the right decision. And um, at the same time, I had so much going on in my personal life outside of like my career. Um, and because at this time I was still working a nine to five 
uh, and working a nine to five, being a, a newly married man, uh, having a newborn son, and and being at a, at a, at a period that's that was, was absolutely a crossroads. Do you decide to continue on this musical path journey, or do you uh, decide to you know play it straight and uh, work the nine to five job, keep the um, uh, keep the career safe, uh, the wife. The, the the child and, and um, follow that path and you know I chose the route the route that um that led to music but at the same time remaining uh, true to uh, uh, my child and, and being like you know this this is never going to be something that I let um this was this didn't happen immediately at first when I um. Uh, attempted to do the nine to five route, that was sort of that bit slap for me. That was kind of like that, that period of like, oh, um, you know, reality is setting in for me. This is it. This is what it's going to be. And for anybody who works a nine to five or anybody who is out there, you know, work, you know, making it, making it work, making ends meet, uh, this is not to discredit or, or uh, devalue or, um, uh, do a disservice to anybody out there working extremely hard and making it work and being committed and loving what you do. Um, this is more of a testament to the individuals who do not love what they, they do. Um, uh, value the work that they're doing, but they're doing it just to do it. Uh, and it would, I, I made a choice based on what I wanted with my life. You know, and, and it, it was a very difficult point in my life. And I could have chose a road and a path that led to me being miserable for the entirety of my life. And I'm just very happy that I chose the other road, you know? And I also firmly believe in this, where if you're in the crossroads of defining your happiness, and if your happiness is being conflated by the status of what's around you, you start to feel it instantaneously. Even when you come across the sense of having wealth and not to just compare or contrast or anything like that, but at the same time, when you do have that sense of wealth in an instant setting, you kind of start to question more as humble people, do I deserve this? And in that case, sometimes people like you or even someone like me in this case, just based on my past experience, you want to make sure that you're staying grounded with the people who love you most, because that's what's going to make you Absolutely. a better person every day. Absolutely. Very well said. Absolutely. Following up with that, and also in the retrospect of going through the pandemic, how did you keep a peace of mind? Um, the pandemic, um, uh, kind of co co it, it was pa parallel to a period in time where I was doing uh, I was having a kind of a second crossroads and this crossroad is kind of like um, uh, a new awakening with mind body and spirit this is where my focus you know started to uh, delve into more yoga and meditation and uh, my my current uh, uh, spiritual belief and shatat nita and 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 acknowledging uh, a need for something more, again, very, very, very uh, important to have our uh, spirit and mind involved in, uh, in, in a space where you're so caught up in the physical. And so I feel in the, in the realm that I was existing in uh, over the past like uh, five years, uh, uh, I would say the past 10 years uh, when we we're counting me changing from a, um, from a meat eater to a plant-based eater, um, I started to check in on my health and wealth, uh, and my health, uh, my my health and wellness, you know, uh, uh, and health being wealth, I should say. Um, so uh, five years ago, uh, I, I met my queen, and uh, we started to, um, you know, trade uh, ideas and, and concepts on how to uh, be better fitted. Uh, mind mentally, uh, spiritually, and, and physically, and so uh, we've been doing this uh, this this growth thing t together in unison, and and with 
within our village and growing the individuals around us and uh, creating forms for individuals to better um, uh, equate themselves with um, a higher vibration. And so in the midst of this and, uh, and with everything that's going on around in the physical, uh, I feel I've been elevated beyond all this uh, clutter in this cloud, this uh, this electromagnetic smog, the, the, what's going on around us. And, and uh, that's not just the, the, the physical uh, world as we know it. Uh, when you step outside your doors and you see the pandemic, but I'm talking about uh, what we hear from, from media, from uh, social media, from the news, from anything that uh, is toxic. Um, I've felt I my parallel during this this existence has uh, been better uh, equipped for uh, this pandemic and all the toxicity around me because of uh, the things that I was doing prep uh, preparatory steps that we were making prior to the pandemic actually occurring. Um, so those realities of, of who, uh, this new uh, normal, uh, this paradigm shift into whatever we're headed towards uh, doesn't have as long lasting, a, uh, long lasting an effect on uh, my physical well-being, my mental well-being, my spiritual well-being because of the steps we took prior to it. That was a very compelling response and something to really go step by step in, in, in terms of your journey. Because if you think about this, right, you have a 16 month journey of this pandemic that has been documented and throughout all these times for you to have such a very humbling answer. And even as somebody as myself who does reflect a lot, it's very nice to hear someone kind of share some of the same thoughts that I've had throughout this process. It's beautiful. That's beautiful. In 20 years of crafting music as someone who's had so many projects out throughout the essence of time, what do you think makes people stay a part of your journey? Um, the ability to relate, I think, uh, more than anything. Um, you know, I've always been one who, um, and I've, I've been talking with a lot of people about uh, getting back on the road again. Uh, I've done big shows and I've done smaller shows, but I've always been um, uh, taken a, a liking and been fond of smaller shows, little intimate settings. Um, creating a, a following in a, a group of individuals, a village uh, on a smaller scale has always been of bigger value for me than creating something of large scale and uh, being uh, you know, lauded and loved uh, and, and adored uh, from a distance, uh, never really meant as much as being face-to-face uh, -face with, a, with a true, hard, a true uh, hardcore fan who we can have an intimate lunch together and have a dialogue about hip-hop and why we uh, share this um, connection through hip-hop. And I think a lot of uh, the individuals I've dealt with uh, through music on a personal level uh, who listen to me uh, for and will listen to me for time immemorial uh, can attest to that that idea. Like anybody who's reached out to me through a DM, because uh, I'm not a social media person. I'm not big on, um, on on social media, but I understand the necessity of it uh, to some degree. And um, when I do utilize it, I need to make sure that like, you know, I interact with any, each and every individual who ever reaches out to me and truly interact with them. You know, um, I care for individuals, period. Not just, you know, like those in my inner circle, but individuals that are calling out and that you can truly, you know, feel their energy and sense and feel that something just isn't right. Uh, I care for them, you know, and, and I, I do that because uh, uh, my, my innate uh, energy, like the, the energy that used to be lying dormant, but now is um, activated uh, through, you know, my, my consistent meditation and my connection with the trees and the plants and the flowers and everything that is around us. That true nature of self makes me want to interact with individuals and have individuals like that around me. And I think 
that's the type of individuals who, you know, gravitate towards my music. That's the type of individuals I appreciate being with my music. And for the other individuals, uh, I never would say like, you know, don't listen to what I do or, or I don't rock with you, but you know, uh, everything, everything happens in its due time. So uh, individuals may get it later and rock with it later, uh, or they may never rock with it. For the ones that have the opportunity to appreciate the art that I feel I've put forth, I, I'm thankful. And, and for the ones that get it later, I'm just as thankful. I also want to say this, and I'm only going to speak in the point of your view in this maybe 30 minute conversation I've had with you so far. Something that I've kind of understood as far as being someone who likes to travel myself and kind of uh, alluding to your points, what I firmly believe in myself is I like to feel like I'm at home in other people's states and kind of the surroundings aside from that, but aside from my home versus feeling like I'm just on tour and being like, okay, I'm at this state, I'm doing these things, but who am I connecting with? Because people like to sightsee, right. which is all fine and dandy. But at the same time, when you're just sightseeing and just embracing the moments that are not really related to other people, you kind of get lost with yourself. So the, your points from before mm -hmm. are things that I, I resonate with a lot as somebody who just likes to personally travel and meet people myself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that That's so very very true and and honestly um you know being in europe so much it it became imp important for me to like start to learn some of the language you know that uh, another german being a very uh uh big part of uh europa and like the 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 whole area landscape outside of uh, like eastern europe uh, i thought it was necessary for me to start studying and in 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 immerse myself in some of the culture out there and a lot of the places I was visiting I was always in Austria I was always in Switzerland or Germany and you know these are this is you know a, a, a language that connects the dots in a lot of these locations so I found it very necessary for me to start to be uh, get get out there, um, immerse myself in the people. Like I want to, I want to be around uh, and see what the, the the local food is. Now being being a plant based, um, and and us having sheet and the chicos with like apps like Happy Cow and and being able to locate where the local um, uh, vegan shop is nearest the nearest vegan shop uh, near you. Uh, it's kind of a cheat sheet, but you know when we were first going out to Europe, we were going to like little uh, small uh, hole in the wall Italian spots um, to make it to make it work. Um, uh, and, and that and and that is so, so, so very important for me to be uh, acclimated to um, individuals cultures. Uh, and, and, and I, I thought you said it uh, very profoundly. Uh, I, if you give me one second, you can still ask me a question. I need to check off for one second to speak um, on, um, uh, I got to send a message real quickly. Sure, absolutely. And just to, just to give you like a second to reflect on this as well. So my final question to you as you are doing that uh, is something that I always like to ask every one of my guests who's been on the platform so far. So with that being said, and something that ties into the narrative of the Change Within podcast, is what the biggest change you want to see for yourself is. Um, so the, I don't, the biggest change, uh, I, I think I, um, uh, it's not that I so much want to see, I want to uh, conti uh, continue to uh, develop. Uh, is the growth to um, a higher version of self to the point where I've reached and attained the, highest, the higher consciousness. Um, higher consciousness and knowledge of self is, is so paramount for me. Um, knowledge of self being um, not, not so caught up in this physical existence of things, but being able to be in a place where I'm connected with the all, with everything 
that is around us, within us, uh, that is a part of us. Um, I, I am seeking that to be one with um, those who came before us, who come after, who understand that time and space is an illusion. The idea of you know partitions, separations between us are, are illusions. And, and the, the truth is we are all interconnected. Our energy is interconnected and I wanna be a better version of and reflection of something divine, something higher than self. And, uh, it's the true knowledge, that's the true key, and, and that's the true change that I seek. I think that was a great way to tie into the conclusion for episode 58 of the Change of Him podcast. With profound conversations like these, and for those who want to check out what we do as a platform, you can please do so by checking out Anchor, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Rex, thank you very much for joining me today, and have a great rest of your day. Peace and blessings. And uh, like I just want to say, that's something we say. That's life, uh, vitality, and health to all in our shit belief system. Absolutely. I'll definitely uh, talk to you soon.